the Cadillac CTSV Gen 2 with a manual. You guys have been requesting this video for a long time, so sit back and enjoy. It probably goes without saying that the Cadillac CTSV's weakest link is its interior. In fact, when Mark got into this for the very first time yesterday, he burst out laughing. He was overwhelmed by GM's attention to detail and quality. And look, this is what I told the owner. You gotta wear the automotive beer goggles. You gotta not touch anything. You gotta stay far away and be intoxicated by its engine because you'll realize that yes, a real interior designer laid everything out, but it was put together by a bunch of interns. Everything squeaks, everything rattles, a lot of the interior quality fitment, the panel gaps are horrendous. But look, I know that, you know that, no one is buying a Cadillac CTSV for a luxury car experience. It's just, you know, it's worth bringing up. So with that, let's talk about some of the finer details, like the seats and the infotainment. The seats in this car, the seating position, and the practicality aspects of this vehicle are great. The seats, these are the base seats, not the Recaros, are very comfortable, and I think they better suit the characteristic of this car being a total cruiser. The pedal box is easy to use, the pedals are well spaced, you can heel toe after some adjustment, the shifter falls right to hand, and the seating position is low enough where you feel like you're an actual sports sedan. The back seats, there's enough room in there for children or small adults, making this car a very practical proposition. So let's talk about the infotainment. The infotainment and interior electronics in this car are superb. Just like in a Ferrari, your traction control switch is right here on the steering wheel. Your suspension settings are here on the dash and you have this lovely screen with DVD capability so I can watch all of my favorite films whenever I want. You have Bluetooth hands-free calling, the infotainment itself both has touch and physical controls, and you have this built-in hard drive where you can rip all your favorite tunes so you can listen to all the Dave Matthews you could possibly want. Oh yeah! We are underneath the 1997 Cadillac CTS-V, Jack. <laughs> God, you're an ass. No, this is the 2013 Cadillac CTS-V. This is the Gen 2 CTS-V. Oh, wow, you're kidding. Well, I know. Could have fooled me. Well, How that, old's this architecture? <laughs> well, this is the Sigma 2 architecture that came out in 2009 when this car was introduced, but it is an evolution of an architecture that came out in 2003. Mmm, that makes more sense. So tell me about all the engineering that went into this. I can't wait. <laughs> So, Mark, you have double wishbone suspension on the front that is aluminum. You have an aluminum subframe, and you have BWIs, or GM's second generation of Magda Ride dampers that allowed this car to be faster than any other production sedan in 2009. Faster than what? An M5, an E92 M3. Around uh, what? The ring. Oh, okay. I mean, sure, GM has a history of cost cutting. But the engineers that were on this team did the best they could given the materials they had. Okay, I'll give you that. So basically, the engineer said, oh, all the money's here, and then, oh no, oh shit. <laughs> this thing's a V6 away from being a buy here, pay here lot, wet dream. But what else have they done? So, they've added coolers. They have an oil cooler, you have a diff cooler, you have a trans cooler, and you have an inner cooler. Mm. They've done their best to solve that problem. And then you have this transmission here. Thankfully, this car is a manual, as I mentioned earlier. It is the TR6060 unit, which is a very well-respected trans. can hold a lot of power. In this car, I don't think it feels that great, but you have the ability to make this transmission feel amazing with a short throw shifter. But the other option for transmissions was a six-speed automatic called the 6L, 6L90 trans. You know what that was shared with? Oh, I, got it. I can't wait. A Chevy Express van. 
Oh, God. Well, Marga managed to corral you back here. There are some interesting things to notice back here, like there is much less aluminum than there is in the front. And mainly, that's because of this entirely steel rear subframe. They did that to strengthen the diff, essentially. So the prior generation diff, the way they had it mounted, is when the owners would launch it hard, the rear end would essentially explode. And that's because, yeah, people are straight up chimpanzees. I mean, I can attest to that. You know, you get, you get your blood going and you yeah, need to go, bah! <laughs> It's the X factor of developing a manual transmission, right? You can't account for all the stupidity that people do when they launch it. And when you have a high horsepower car like this, there's a ton of driveline shock. So I can sympathize with that part, trying to make all this stuff work. So what else, what other problems do we have? So there are two real problems with the Cadillac CTSV. The first being the Magna Ride dampers. As most dampers age, they leak or they have issues. The problem is Magna Ride dampers are historically very expensive. The next issue with this car, and it really only pertains to you if you're gonna take this to the track or autocross it, which honestly you probably should if you have a car like this, is the airbags have a tendency to deploy under high G-forces. No impact? No impact. I'm saying you're running over rumble strips, you're drifting it and suddenly catching it. And that's because, I mean, this car was built post and pre-GM bankruptcy. So they use their back sensors from the City Express van as well. Pretty much. Mark, you know what this is? Something that looks amazing. This has a huge blower on top. Yeah. So I'm, now I'm excited. <laughs> this is the LSA engine. And this is why you buy this Cadillac. It's not the way it looks. It's definitely not the interior. What about the brakes? Well, the brakes also help, but you're buying this because it's 550 horsepower. No way, it's that much. And 550 foot-pounds of torque. Okay. Yeah, All right. it's pretty badass. Yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> you, it stops with a six-piston front Brembo's, four-piston rears, and it's kind of like a discount LS9. The LS9 was found in the C6ZR1, and that baby made 650 horsepower. So what do they change here that's different from the... So the blower is still a twin screw unit, but it's smaller in displacement. And then the internals, yes, it's the same block, boring stroke, all that other fun stuff, but the rods and pistons are no longer forged. So they, they cut corners there. But this makes significantly less horsepower, and this car doesn't need that kind of horsepower either. No, but this block, though, the LSA block, which was also in the Camaro ZL1, could hold up to like 850 wheel horsepower pretty reliably. The big issue with this motor is the, how much heat it produces. Yeah. Obviously, if you're running this on the track, or really what people are doing with this car is drag racing, it's going to pull timing once it starts getting heat soaked. Yeah, that's pretty common with forced induction cars, but I'm tired of talking about it. I want to I wanna see what it's like on the road, Jack. All right, Mark. All right, Mark, we're setting off in the daddy lag. <laughs> wow. Dude, that's nutty. Yes, this is ballistically <laughs> fast. Wow. <laughs> I gotta, oh be God. I, I gotta be honest, that's the first time I've ever felt this thing be launched like that, and it, it's kind of changed my mind a bit about how stupid this is. Uh, so, to, to be fair to you, this car's got two distinct personalities, CPA accountant and Billy Bob, right? It's, it's not a Corvette in a suit. It does not feel like one to drive, but it does have basically an LS motor with a big blower, it makes 550 horsepower, but most importantly, it has a six-speed manual. Yeah. <laughs> to me, this entire experience is dominated by that blower and the this is <laughs> the blower and the engine. That's why you buy this 100 percent Yes, it does have four doors. And it sounds like this. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I can see a little bit more why the owner bought this. The when you put the price in perspective, what is this? He paid, so manual CTSVs, regardless, sedan, wagon, or coupe, are incredibly rare. And he got a really clean one for high 30s. <laughs> so you get a four-door car that you can fit things in. You can fit kids in the back, pretty much all your normal tasks. It feels like a sleeper. It's a total sleeper. And you have this insane acceleration and great sound from an engine with a manual transmission. Now we can argue the finer points of how all of it works together because 
It's like <laughs> the C5 Corvette, when you pull the door handle, it's like somebody's wrinkling a plastic bag. I mean, it just, you know, that's one of the trade-offs of having a GM product. This is post-bankruptcy GM. It, it doesn't feel like a quality product, particularly when you consider some of its contemporaries, like an E90 M3. Yeah. Um, and I also think another negative, and that's just because it's, you know, typical GM stuff, is the trans. I think they nerfed this to almost feel like an M5, which is what they benched it again. But Mark, let me tell you something this does very well, or show you. Oh, it's the Jack, <laughs> the, the Jack uh, Singapore Jungle Gym machine. <laughs> it, it does... It feels, it's not as easy to drift as a Hellcat, but you know, it's not $65,000 and it has a manual. This is like the ultimate America, America mobile. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, okay, so this is a total jack car. Um, but is it flashy enough for you? Is this the car that you well, would drive every day? When I pull up to the country club, <laughs> when I have my meetings, when I meet my many mistresses, they aren't impressed by this Cadillac. It it doesn't have the presence of an E60 M5 or you know any of any of that flashiness. But you know it's cheap. I think because it's not super flashy, you can get away with doing things like that. People just think it's a regular Cadillac. My my negatives though, and I do have a couple. First, the manual trans. I'm grateful we have it, but it feels like a BMW trans. It's very rubbery. It feels like it's just connected to a children's toy. Very plasticky. Granted, it's rare. <laughs> yeah, who cares if it feels like shit? It's it works. It's durable. The rear differential's durable. The car is durable. You just have to deal with, as we started with, the many trade-offs of having this era GM product. Interior isn't good, and the other thing I think that it's worth bringing up is if you read a lot of the era reviews, they're like, wow, this thing defies gravity. It feels way less than 4,300 pounds. It doesn't. No. It feels huge. It never masks its weight. It is technically capable, and I'm sure it can get around corners reasonably well, but it's not like modern cars. If you get into a modern M5, it does not feel like it's north of 4,000 pounds. This, you feel every single pound. Yeah, and we had this brief discussion on how the modern, heavy luxury cars do an, an amazing job, and they've had to by necessity because cars have gotten bigger to be able to make the car feel much smaller than it is. This still feels big, despite the fact that it has Magna Ride of this generation. This is the first generation Magna Ride. Second gen. Second gen, okay. And I'm impressed by it. I really am. It's, it maintains a very supple ride while still giving you enough body control. But this is not something you're going to ever attack corners in, of course. But this is something that you could blow down any road. It feels like it would go 200 miles an hour. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's that fast. It is astronomically quick. It makes for a great daily. Yes, you have some compromises, but I get the appeal. Let's head into the final thoughts and discuss the summary of the CTSV. All right. <laughs> Final thoughts on the CTSV. As this video started, there's a overtone of negativity towards some of the cost cutting and cheapness in this Cadillac. And that is because this was originally designed to be that luxury sports car, grand tour, whatever. But here's the thing. Like Jack said, nobody is buying this for any type of luxury appointments. It's a four door sleeper that is insanely fun when you get it out on the road, you shift it, you shift it manually, you hear the whine of the supercharger and you feel the pull of this insane motor in a car that really shouldn't have a motor like this. That is the huge draw to it. Suspension wise, the Magna Ride is way better than I expected given it was kind of the second gen. On the street when you're kind of puttering around in soft mode, it's good. When you put it in full sport, it's not back-breaking. And the, it does a great job managing the body control. Is this something like a modern system? No, it's still a little bit jarring. And because of the creaks, the rattles, the way that the door panels are assembled, it makes it feel way worse because every, there's a symphony of all this crap going on around you. But again, you can pile people in it, you can put kids in the back, you can haul your groceries in it, and you can go crazy fast, and it makes a ton of noise 
and you feel like an absolute beast while you drive it. And most of the time, nobody knows what the hell it is. What's better than that besides the price? $36,000 for something that's going to absolutely obliterate the tires and most anything else on the road. With that said, big thanks to the owner for letting us utilize his car to the fullest. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.